slot, Matt. And uh, yeah, thanks, Dionic, for uh, inviting me to uh, talk here uh, at this and for everybody who's uh, tuned in. So this is actually one of my absolute favorite topics. Uh, I'm a bit, um, I, can, I have a tendency to get on a pedestal about that. this one. Um, it really is, in my opinion, absolutely inexcusable bordering on insane, how many companies don't understand this most fundamental of points. Um, in terms of really, first of all, just, I mean, forget process and methodology and everything like that. We can just talk about the profit motive. All you have to do is look at the most valuable companies in the world and why don't more companies want to work that way? Uh, of course, that's a, a longer discussion about the reasons they don't and uh, probably better over a beer. But as far as as uh, as far as this fundamental idea of the role of engineers, this is really what I wanted to talk about here. And I, you know, obviously I don't know what company you actually work for um, and I don't know exactly how you work inside your company, but... In my experience, the majority of companies do not have empowered engineers. Now, just to be clear, uh, every engineer, really, you find I you, empowerment does not mean that you get to choose the best way to code something. Empowerment doesn't even mean that you get to choose which frameworks to use uh, when you build something. Empowerment means you get to figure out the best way to solve a problem, what approach, what capability. So what I'm really getting at in this talk is making sure that all of you that are engineers understand that your company really needs you to do more than just code. And that's uh, that's going to be where I'm, I'm going to try to convince you of that. So um for those that don't know maybe some of my background, because we all bring biases and perspective. Um, but I started as an engineer for the first 10 years of my career. I worked at HP Labs, uh, which at the time was HP was a you know much bigger company than it is today. And uh, that was the applied research lab. I was actually in the software technology lab. So I worked on programming languages, frameworks, tools, IDEs. Uh, and even some operating system work for the different, uh, I mean, at the time, desktop computers, mini computers, uh, personal computers, um, and even handheld computers at the time. So after HP, I got very lucky because uh, many of you know Netscape was the original internet company. And uh, I worked for Mark Andreessen, again, because I had done all these products. I should have mentioned at HP, all the products I built were products for other developers. So you could tell this is a, a space I really like. Uh, and Netscape was the same. Netscape, I was responsible for platform and tools. Of course, now the, the platform was not Windows. It was now the internet. And so uh, we assembled a platform, uh, JavaScript. It included uh, SSL, first versions of all these components. And in fact, many of them came from places other than Netscape. And uh, so for a platform person like me, a tools person doesn't get any better than that job at Netscape. After about uh, six years, we, uh, we eventually lost the browser wars, if you remember your internet history to Microsoft. And so I joined a young eBay um, because I knew the co I met the co-founder through the uh, Pierre Omajar through the developer program. And uh, really eBay was one of the first true applications built on the internet. And uh, of course, it was a marketplace. It was actually the only time in my career I was doing products that weren't primarily for developers. These were eBay, of course, is for buyers and sellers. Um, and anyway, after eBay, I just started with a few friends building a uh, practice of working with doing writing, working with startups. Many of those startups became bigger companies. I, the timing was perfect. I got to work with early Amazon, early Google, um, uh, early LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook later. Um, yeah, pretty much the normal cast of characters. Um, and what I focus on really is the difference between how the best companies work and the rest and trying to close that gap. All right. So Let's get to the heart of it. 
if you look at the source of innovation, what the real source of innovation is, first of all, it's really important to clear up the most common myth around where great products come from because so many people think they actually come from customers uh, or just as bad as they think it comes from um, executives. Uh, in fact, Steve Jobs used to hold up his uh, iPhone and say, you can conduct 100 focus groups. You will never get an iPhone. Bezos, of course, is reminding people, he does this every year, reminds people every year that, yeah, that's not where great products come from. Uh, of course, yes, no customer asked for Prime which is, of course, one of the most successful tech products of all time. Uh, another one, he recently said, no customer asked for AWS. Um, same thing. The point is, this is so important to understand, but customers don't know what's possible. And so that is our job. And I'm speaking our in the sort of Royal Weep product teams. That is the job of a product team to know what's just possible. Now, customers often know what they're struggling with. They know where their pain is, but they don't know what's possible. That's why focus groups don't work because you're, you're basically asking people that don't know what's possible to tell you what they want. So, okay, this is a first principle of modern product. This is not where you get good products. And it's not just customers. And of course, it's not that your customers are not smart or anything like that. It's that they their job is not to follow the latest in technology. I'll give you lots of examples of this in a minute. Um, but similarly, your executives don't know either. Your stakeholders don't know either. In fact, very often your product managers and your designers don't know either, which is why consistently the single most effective source of innovation is your engineers, you. <laughs> um, now, the reason for that is very practical. It's because the engineers are working with the enabling technology every single day. So it puts them in the best possible position to see what's just now possible. Now, and that, sort of fundamental truth is what distinguishes, I would argue, the best companies from the rest. Um, some of you may know, I've heard of this guy, but, but many of you probably haven't. His name was Bill Campbell. He's known as Coach Campbell. Um, in his earlier life, he was actually a, a football coach at Columbia University, by his own admission, not very good. But he came to Silicon Valley as a younger guy, and he uh, he worked for Apple. Um, he actually was the head of Claris, if you remember their original software division. And then he uh, actually became CEO of Intuit. You probably all know Intuit. And then he, um, he became a board member and just wanted to coach leaders. Uh, one thing that very few people realize, but is amazing to me, this guy literally personally coached Steve Jobs, when he in the early years of Apple, uh, Jeff Bezos at early years of Amazon, and Larry and Sergey in the first decade at Google. Now, I I was never lucky enough to be personally coached by him. I did meet him several times because three of the managers I've had in my career were actually coached by him. So I really grew up in my career hearing his lessons. Uh, and in fact, when I first started writing, I, I wrote an article about him uh, with these lessons I had learned from him. And I, I ran it by him because I wanted to make sure he, he liked it. It was totally glowing, of, like you might imagine. But he asked me not to publish it because he didn't want the attention on him. He wanted the attention on the people he coaches. Uh, and, and he had said the same thing for many years to the press. He passed away a, few, a couple of years ago. But um, one of the things, you know, it's really interesting. A lot of people say what you really need is a, a strong product culture in your company to do great products. But if you think about it, Apple, Amazon, Google, if you've been inside those companies, you know they have very different cultures. But they're all three great at product. And I would argue this is true. They know that this is true in all of those companies, that the engine for innovation is the engineers. 
And what's really ironic to me is I continue to meet these companies. Not only do they not think of engineers this way, they just want to think of engineers as people that code that'll basically code whatever you pay them to code. But they don't even often, they're, they're often not even employees. They are literally outsourced. They hire an agency and they say, you know, here's the spec, build this. I always tell them in a good product company, they would no sooner outsource their engineers than they would outsource their CEO. So this really is a fundamental principle behind great product companies. And really what we'll talk about is how to really make this happen, how to, uh, how to uh, ensure this is in place. Now, to me, what, what's special about great tech products is really they are inspired by real customer need. So, of course, we all know, and I'm guilty of this too. For years, I worked in technology teams that really were there to push the edges of technology. And, of course, I've worked on my share of things that were technically possible, but pretty uninteresting as far as whether anybody wanted them or could use them. Uh, probably the... Uh, Extreme example of that is all the time I wasted doing technology written in Lisp, which was not very helpful because people were not interested in waiting for garbage collection to finish. So um, it's inspired by real customer things, but it's built with technology that is just now possible. And that's it's when those two things come together that the magic happens. Um, now, just because of time, I won't go into detail in all these, but I like to, um, when I sit down with organizations, I really want them to grok this point. It is all important. And so I'll give them, I tell them the backstories of many of the products that I know they love and admire, where they came from. Alexa. I mean, you'll see the answer where they all, all these came from engineers. They didn't come from executives. They didn't come from product managers. They came from engineers. In most cases, understanding the issues and building a prototype and showing that prototype uh, so that people really understood the po power or the potential of that idea. Of course, Alexa is off to an amazing start in Amazon scale, this is still be considered really a startup, but for most companies, this would be already a very successful product line. Um, and of, I, of course, everybody knows Amazon is probably the most consistently innovative company out there, but Disney, who's a super old company, I don't even remember how old, but they're way pre-internet. Um, and so a lot of people think, yeah, unless you're Amazon or unless you're Google, you can't really innovate, but it's really not true. Um, if you've been to Disney World lately, you know, Disney invested over a billion dollars into the infrastructure to support this new technology that uh, really lets them reimagine the experience of a guest coming to Disney World. There's a great story behind that. Um, but it's another great example of engineers, designers working together to show what's possible and then to make it happen. Um, Google Translate is actually one of the purest examples of technology-based innovation. This is one of the best examples of machine learning as applied to, um, you know, they try to apply it to many areas at Google, but this is one of the biggest wins. They actually changed the insides of Google Translate without changing the experience. Uh, and they wanted to see if users would actually notice based on the quality of the translation, which worked. I mean, it really did happen. People noticed how did this happen? It went from pretty bad, honestly, just better than anything else, but not very good to remarkably good. If you haven't used Google Translate lately, you should check it out. It's remarkable. Um, and that is a pure example of combining a real need just to, with technology that was just now possible. Um, you know, there's the iPhone itself. Um, of course, it's probably the most successful product of all time. But if you look at the iPhone, there are, you know, it's three and a half years. I think it's 11 or 12 years since the first iPhone came out. But it's three and a half years of product discovery for the first iPhone. And there were a lot. I mean, that was a very risky, difficult effort, the first iPhone, which, of course, we're talking a whole stack of hardware, firmware 
operating system application software. But by Apple's own analysis, the hardest part was trying to figure out how to enter text on a 100% touchscreen device. Nobody had done that at the time. Today, of course, it's everywhere. But at the time, nobody had figured that out. And that was actually a very hard problem. And most of the ways, sort of top-down ways, were not working. Finally, um, uh, one of the engineers, a tech lead, and uh, teamed up with a designer with a very different approach to text entry that finally gave Apple the hope that it was going to work. And by the way, Apple was already nervous about this because the Newton, if you remember the Newton, some of you may be old enough to remember the Newton, was was uh, failed. And by Apple's and most people's own analysis, it failed because it was too hard to enter text. So they were already aware of this risk. And of course, the rest was history there. Um, Spotify, another good example. Spotify really understands the power of uh, empowered engineers. Um, and uh, Discover Weekly is, is uh, I realized the word discovery there is uh, uh, two different uses of the term, but Discover Weekly, as many of you know, it's a machine learning based playlist. Um, and so many people have been surprised at this machine generated playlist and the quality of that playlist. Um, and of course, there's a lot of good business reasons why they do this for some of the same business reasons Netflix does this kind of work. But um, great example of uh, technology powered, customer inspired. Love it. So and, and I, I obviously gave you examples there of consumer companies because everybody really knows these companies. And, um, and you know, there's really little question. If you have a consumer product and customers don't love it, you're going to go nowhere fast. But Workiva, I'd be surprised if any of you know Workiva, um, unless you happen to work there because it's not aimed at people like you and me. It's aimed at accountants, at public companies that have to do uh, – boatload of reporting for the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this is a the opposite end of the, you know, if the iPhone is one kind of sexy, this is the other end of the spectrum. But um, I will tell you, Workiva's products is the only company I know in the enterprise software space where their net promoter scores are higher than Apple. Think about that. Ask yourself if you know of any enterprise software that is that loved by its users. But that is exactly what they do. Even though they do hardcore finance software, the company was founded by six engineers that were committed to improving the lives of those users by leveraging technology. They were right on the leading edge and still actually on the very leading edge of, uh, uh, of cloud-based technology, of providing a very uh, rich experience that runs in a browser. Um, and... Yeah, remarkable job they've done applying technology to solve problems. In fact, they've taken that and have solved several other problems now, and they have gone from nobody to a very successful multi-billion dollar unicorn company. So uh, it is not just consumer companies. All right, that's what I mean by customer inspired. All of those products addressed real needs for people uh, in ways that were just now possible. That's really what, what good product companies and good teams do. So now let's talk a little more about how to set you up for this level of success. In many companies, you're not set up for this. In fact, they, they have set up their company in such a way that innovation is almost impossible. And this is the part that really gets me riled up. It's almost impossible. The uh, engineers are rarely even invited into the room when they're deciding what to do. Usually the first time engineers see a product idea is it's sprint planning. It's already been in corporate planning. It's already been on roadmaps for quarters. And it finally gets to you know the engineers at sprint planning, which of course is a sign of complete failure. The Engineers need to be there, you know, when the idea is just sort of a sparkle in the eye, not when it's sprint planning. So how do you really set that up? For those that don't know Leslie Kilgore, she was one of the earliest leaders at Netflix. She's still on the board of Netflix. Netflix is another great example of what we're talking about. Their company is built on the idea of empowered teams and empowered engineers. Um, 
one of the mantras they have there is that lead we should lead with context not control what they're saying is command and control telling engineers what to build is not why we hire these people we provide them the context the context meaning what's the vision what's the product strategy what are the business constraints let them meet the customers. Let them meet the users. A lot of the times, that's where the magic happens. And then let these engineers come up with the best solution to the problem. So we're, what I want to do is double click in a little bit on how we do this, how a company sets up. Now, what I'm about to describe, honestly, is pretty consistent across all these great product companies. But it is true that I uh, am using neutral terms for these things. And I'm trying to untangle the personalities of these founders because a lot of times the, their product culture is wrapped up in the personalities of the founders. Obviously, it was at Apple with Steve Jobs. So let's do that. Let's talk about this idea of an empowered product team. Okay, first of all, and I want to I want to, uh, at the risk of sounding a little harsh, I'm going to draw contrast with the way good companies work and how most companies work. Because my fear is that many of you, if not most of you, are working not in a company set up like this. You're working in an, what we call feature team company. And, uh, and I want you to understand why yeah, you might be able to choose your mobile framework, but you're not going to be able to come up with a great solution to the problems your company needs. So you, I want to make sure you're in a position to really make a difference for your company and your users. All right, so empowered product teams, just starting with the purpose. The purpose of an empowered product team is to invent in, innovate, invent on behalf of our customers. Now, that may sound obvious to you, but that is not the purpose of a typical feature team. Typical feature team, they will literally tell you that your purpose is to uh, serve the business. That's the phrase you'll see. You're supposed to be there to build features and projects for the business. You hear that phrase, the business. And they, by the way, they think of you as IT. They think of you as a cost center. They don't think of you as the core enabler of the company. And that's what you are. You need to be if you're a tech-powered company. So in a good product company, you're there to, to come up with great solutions for your customers that your customers love, but that works for your business. So you can't ignore the marketing costs. You can't ignore uh, security constraints, compliance constraints. You can't ignore sales, go to market limitations. Um, you can't ignore costs. You have to worry about monetization. That's what we mean by needs of the business. And, and yeah, that's hard. Coming up with a product that's both something customers love and works for the business, it's actually a lot easier to just worry about your customers. <laughs> it's much harder to have something your customers love but still work for the business. But that's what we've got to do. Second is how these teams work. In an empowered product team, Rather than giving you a roadmap of features and projects to build, you're given a set of problems to solve. Now, I want to be clear. Features to build is output. Problems to solve, these are outcomes. So, for example, instead of giving you a roadmap that has something like, you know, add video-based training so that our hopefully our onboarding is better, Instead of, say, video-based training comes out two months, here's what it needs to be, they say, look, our problem is onboarding. It takes way too long. Or even more generally, our problem is not enough of our customers like our service, so every year they unsubscribe. Churn, it's called. That's a business problem. It's also a customer problem. The customer problem might be it takes too long to learn how to work this thing. It's crazy. They don't, they're not willing to do it. They don't want to watch a video to figure out how to use the product. So fix it. That's, that's how we give work to product teams as opposed to features on a roadmap. Now, if you're given features on a roadmap, basically you have, you basically need to do a little design. You have to design that feature, 
You might do a little usability testing, and then you build it. QA, test it, deploy it. In an empowered product team, we're not given that feature. We're given a problem to solve. So the first thing we need to do is figure out a solution that works. Now, that's hard. That's product discovery. I'll talk about that next. But we have to discover and develop an effective solution. And even more profound, we are now held accountable to the results. So if today, let's say today, 10% of our uh, customers every year, our business customers for a SaaS service, let's say 10% of them churn on us. They just decide this is not worth the cost. That's very high. I mean, and that would be um, at that level of churn, you are probably burning money way too fast. And it, it doesn't even pay to spend money on marketing because you're just going to lose it. So the the you might sit down with your leaders and say, all right, we need to work. The leaders say, you need to work on churn. It's a problem. Um, and right today, we're 10%. We need to get that down to at least 6%. So uh, what can you do? Go work on that problem. Now, of course, we have lots of techniques to go figure out the best way to solve that problem. But that is what an empowered product team does. That's how they work. You notice, it's worth pointing out, you can't, if you're given a roadmap of features, even if you build those features, even if they had perfect quality, you know, well-designed, if those features don't solve the underlying problem, and by the way, in most companies, they don't. 80% of the time, roughly, according to Harvard Business Review, 80% 80, 80 of the time, the features we build don't solve the underlying problem. Well, if that's the case, we haven't, you know, you can't blame the fee, the product team. Uh, they will try to, of course, the executives will say, you know, the engineers took too long or they cut too many features or whatever. And um, that's just the reality of giving them output. If you give the team a problem to solve, you can hold them accountable to the results. All right, that's important. So in an empowered product team, we actually have to come up with a solution that works. Uh, the most common term for that is product discovery. I mean, it's called discovery because we admit we don't know the answer in advance. Now, product discovery is a massive topic. It usually takes me several days with a team and a whiteboard to go through all the major techniques we use. Um, fundamentally, it's about trying out a lot of product ideas and doing that very quickly. We usually use prototypes. We have four kinds of prototypes that are very common. Um, and by the way, most of the prototypes are actually created not by the engineers. They're created by the designer. Some of the prototypes are created by engineers. They're more exceptions. Um, but we create these prototypes in order to test uh, that we have come up with a solution that's valuable, meaning people will choose to use it or buy it, usable, they can figure out how to use it, feasible, we know how to build it with the technology stack we have, with the skill set we have, with the time we have, and viable, meaning it works for our business within the parameters and constraints of our business. Now, we have quantitative techniques for doing this. We have qualitative techniques for doing this. Uh, we So it, it's a lot. In fact, I wrote a book called Inspired that is all about the techniques that good product teams use to discover a solution worth building. I just basically said this. This is what we mean by an effective solution. Valuable, usable, feasible, viable. Now, what I want to talk about next is what are the skills we need in order to pull that off? We need three kinds of skills generally in a product team. The product manager, and I mean a real product manager, not talking just a simple product owner. I mean a real product manager. That is also obviously the product owner on the team. Uh, a real product designer, I'll talk about what I mean by that, and of course, empowered engineers. Um, and now what I have here is it's showing the engineers are on the hook for feasibility and obviously delivery. Uh, the designer is on the hook for usability. The product manager is on the hook for value and viability. But that doesn't mean that they don't each contribute to all of them. They do. For example, if you are lucky enough to have worked with a good designer, you know that these designers can help 
in so much beyond just a usable solution. They really have a way, a good ones, of getting inside the heads of the users, which is incredibly useful to us. Just like um, I mentioned before, often engineers don't just have a better, a, a good way of implementing something, but they realize there's a better way of approaching the problem. So will the, the engineering will lead to a very different functionality or a very different experience. That's what we're looking for. All right, so let's go through those roles. Um, obviously, I'm assuming you know the most about the engineering role. I meet a lot of engineers that have never worked with a professional product manager because they've never worked in one of these companies like we're talking about. And so they haven't seen this. In fact, for most of them, in most companies, the product manager is not even really a product manager, they're project managers. So they really bring very little to the table. But in an, an empowered product team that that's, that's needs to come up with a solution that's valuable and usable and feasible and viable, we need somebody that understands these four things. Deep understanding of our users and customers, how they work, how they make a purchase decision, how they actually, uh, what are the different kinds of users they have for this product. The product data, how is our product used, uh, both in a, a user analytics sense of what they're using, their what they're pressing on on their phone, on their app, uh, in the sense of sales analytics, what are they actually purchasing, and Data warehouse analytics, how is this changing over time? The product manager needs to be the data center person. Now they might have access to a data analyst or even a data scientist, but the product manager brings this deep knowledge of what's just now happening. Uh, the product manager also needs to have a deep understanding of the dimensions of the business I was describing before, uh, how it's sold, marketed, what the capabilities of the sales organization is, what uh, what the costs involved for uh, marketing strategies are, what the um, financial constraints are, what the um, privacy and security considerations are. They also have to understand the, industry, the competitive landscape and they have to understand the major industry trends because you need to decide what's a fad, what's a trend. That is all on the product manager. This is what the product manager needs to be bringing to your team. The designer, you know what they bring essentially and you know what you bring as engineers, but often the engineers don't know what they should expect from the product manager. This is what you should expect from a product manager. If you're not getting this, then you really have a problem as far as being a, an empowered team because you won't have the context that you need to make good choices. This is the context. All right. Just to be clear on design, I am not talking about just a graphic designer here. I mean product design, which is really service design, interaction design, visual design, user research. It is a, you know, a great, a strong product designer is worth their weight in gold. If you, uh, if you go talk to pretty much any engineer at Apple, there's a very good chance that daily when we're not in a pandemic, they go to lunch with their designer. It is just, um, that those two are so closely tied and they should be. Uh, those two are probably the root of where the great product work comes from. So yes, it's not just look and feel. And then of course, for engineers, um, uh, I already gave you the Bill Campbell quote about there's nothing more important than an empowered engineer. Steve Jobs famous, we don't hire all these engineers so we can tell them what to do. We hire them so they can show us what's possible. That is, uh, I really want to raise the bar for you. Now, it's also fair to acknowledge not every engineer cares about what they build. There are plenty of engineers that are just like, look, I don't care. Just, just tell me what you need and I'll code it. And honestly, since we have a set of engineers on a team, in my experience, it's fine if some of your engineers are that way. I will tell you in the best product companies, when they interview engineers, they're trying to screen these people out. <laughs> they want people who care about not just how they build, but what they build. 
they uh, they try very hard to get those people because they know that's where innovation comes from. But in truth, even in those companies, I have met engineers that are like, I don't really care. I get more excited about worrying about fault tolerance, get much more excited about worried about very large scale, planetary scale. And so, okay, we have plenty of room for that. As long as our tech lead, our most senior engineer cares about what we build, we can do well. All right. And then um, Avid, by the way, is a uh, just a terrific product leader. Uh, started in engineering also, moved into product, moved into general leadership. She's a uh, 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 longtime Google Ventures um, partner. And I, I, she's just right on here. A leader should articulate what needs to be done and why, and then let the team figure out the best way to do it. And that's really the principle behind empowered product teams. And of course, the premise there is really two things. One is obviously they're going to be more motivated. They're going to feel more sense of ownership if they are literally given the latitude to figure out the best way to solve the problem. But even more tactically, these are the people who are working with the technology every single day, the team. These are the people that if you're doing what good teams do are meeting with users and customers every single week. Who is in a better position to figure out the best solution to the problem? So that's the premise. All right, just to tie this up, if you're not sure you're working on an empowered product team or if maybe you're just working in a feature team company, then this is an easy way for you to self-assess. First of all, is your team truly cross-functional? I want to be clear. Some people say cross-functional and what they really mean is front and back end engineers or something silly like that. That is not what we mean by cross-functional. Uh, we are talking about the full range of skills. So that's typically product management, product design, the different kinds of engineering you need based on the technology stack you have. And um, it may include uh, user research. It may include a data scientist. It may include product marketing. So whatever is necessary, we need to make sure we have those skills and that they are competent in those skills. That's a big prerequisite. Second, they're empowered, which means that they're not given features and projects to build. They're given problems to solve. And the team is given the space and the permission to go figure out the best way to solve those problems. And finally, they're accountable for solving the actual customer or business problem. Now, the team comes up with what they say they can do. But if they say, this is what we're committing to, the idea is that if their first approach doesn't work, maybe they build three features, but it doesn't actually move the needle, then they're not done. They either are going to iterate on those features or they're going to try other features or different approach or redesign or whatever. But they keep going until they achieve that outcome. And that's the difference. Those three things is really, that's what defines an empowered product team. And in when I talk to companies, the good ones, these three things are true. And that's what I'm looking for. And the rest don't understand that. They think that some executive with an MBA is going to write out all these features and somehow it's going to be good. No. All right. Um, hopefully Matt's still there and we can uh, talk if about do some questions. I did want to mention uh, there's now a new book too called Empowered. Um, Inspired is all about um, Inspired is all about how product discovery is done. And so if you've never worked on a team working this way, I would encourage you. That's who the book's for. And I think you'll love it. I mean, the, the techniques that good teams use, they're fun. You'll get more done, more innovation than ever before. Empowered, though, is if you're in a company that doesn't allow you to work that way, Empowered is really for your leaders to help them uh, learn what they need to do to provide you the environment you need to do good work. So there's Matt back. Hey, thanks for thanks for walking us through all of this, Marty. I definitely appreciate it. You bet. Uh, 
and as a, a multi-year student of uh, your your books and what you bring to the table, every time I hear you talk or reread one of your books, I, I always kind of gets my brains turning, right? Like more stuff starts coming back and be like, oh yeah, like maybe I'm not doing good at like that part right now and I need to get better at that. So I appreciate, appreciate you hopping on board with us for sure. Uh, I have Inspire. Definitely go out and grab it uh empowered i believe you said just came out right like last just week came out last week i tried to find it in a bookstore but as <laughs> you know, uh, getting out of the house is hard these days uh so i couldn't find one in time uh that being said we do have some questions that come in from the audience uh if you are watching and have a question feel free to submit one i think on the right hand side and uh we'll get to them uh as we go here so marty I mean, you kind of just hit this with uh, with the difference between the first and the second book, right? Empowered being more focused on leadership, starting to move the culture in this direction. How do you begin that culture shift? Like, is there a first step someone can take in a company that doesn't work this way today? Sure. Um, of course, transforming a whole company is a big endeavor. Uh, and of course, I think that's sort of the ultimate objective. However, what can a specific product person do, whether you're an engineer on a team or a designer or a product manager? Turns out you can do quite a bit, but it's more at, here's what I recommend is now, of course, if the company's all making a ton of money and everything's going great, you'll probably get very little interest from the uh, leaders. <laughs> but in most cases, that's not the case. Uh, if they haven't innovated in a while, and especially if your company is sort of in the crosshairs of a good company like Amazon, or uh, for example, the financial services industry, another good company I haven't mentioned in this call was uh, Stripe. Um, Stripe is disrupting a lot of uh, players in the financial services space. And so a lot of places, a, a lot of companies that were up until recently complacent are starting to sort of feel the fear of God. And so once they kind of understand that, yeah, we got to get serious about this, that begs the question of like, well, then how does Amazon work? How does Stripe work? What's going on? And so if your company has reached that point, it's the perfect time for an engineer to say to the leaders, you know, I, I understand that we don't work the same way that some of these great companies do. And what do you think about us doing a little experiment? What do you think about letting our team work this way for a quarter or two? And then we'll see how it works, right? This is called a pilot team, right? Effectively, it's like an informal A-B test inside the company. Yeah. And uh, most executives I know ha will absolutely be happy with that. You know, it's like at the least they're willing to do is a little experiment. This is very low risk. It's very low cost. And of course they figure like, if it doesn't work, well, okay, we just do what we've always done. But if it does work, maybe there's something there and, uh, we can spread it. So that's what I recommend. Um, now, of course, if you do want to start working that way, you've got some work to do. Usually what it means is we need the designer and engineers to step up their game a little, not a lot. Most engineers and designers know what they've already been trained in what we've been talking about, but they do need to step up in the sense of you're not just there to code anymore. Somebody else's stuff. You need to step up to help figure out what we should code, right? So that's a bigger role. And the, the role that's the biggest change is usually the product manager. You, you really need to convince your product manager to up her game uh, or whoever. And once you've done that, you can absolutely get to work. And you know, with some luck, you make some real progress and it starts spreading that way around the organization. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially if there's some of that kind of need of the company to to innovate or take it to the next level uh, due to due to fear, right, or or anything going on in the in their industry. So makes a lot of sense. Uh, we got definitely have a few more here. Do you think there's uh, any issues like balancing uh, on one side empowering engineers, but on the other side over engineering? Like, is that something we have to worry about at all? Um, 
I, I don't think they're uh, at odds. They're orthogonal points. They're, they're both critical points. Um, certainly, you know, I just made the case about empowering your engineers and why. Uh, Over-engineering, and this, of course, very quickly leads into the tech debt discussion. That's probably where a lot of this comes from. Um, too much tech debt is is the biggest issue. <laughs> uh, too much tech debt, I, and I'm not exaggerating, it kills so many companies. And I have got very good, actually, at sitting down with the CEO and CFO and scaring them to death about what happens if they don't start taking tech debt seriously. So too much tech debt is an even bigger problem. Over-engineering does happen, uh, of course. Uh, I've seen it. You've probably seen it, but that's a lot lesser issue. The biggest, the root of that is usually because the product leader, not the technology leader. And just to be clear, the person absolutely on the hook to make sure the tech debt does not kill your company is your CTO, head of technology, VP engineering, whatever that senior engineer title is. That is the person. And you cannot, if it, because if you don't do this, you're the one that's going to be fired. That's what happens at all these companies. But what usually happens when you have an over-engineering situation is that the product leader has not provided a clear product vision for what you, what you need to be doing over the next several years. What, and that, you know, so let's say you're an organization struggling with significant tech debt. You've put off replatforming for too long. You've got to do it, but you don't have a clear vision for what you need to do over the next several years. So then you're really in a bind. Uh, you have really two choices, the engineering leaders. One choice is we'll guess. We'll guess. We think, oh, well, uh, you know, Bitcoin's going to be big, so we're going to support that even if it turns out to be totally irrelevant, right? So that would be a bad thing. And those guesses are very expensive mistakes. <laughs> Excuse me. The more common problem is rather than guessing wrong, the engineering leaders say, well, we can't get anything out of products. So here's what we do. We know what we have to do today. Let's just go build a better platform for doing what we do today. That's a classic replatforming. And so two years from now, we have a platform that would have been good for us for the last five years, rather than a platform that will take us for the next five years. So the root of that is, you, as the, I tell the technology leaders, number one, you are responsible for your architecture and not having this level of tech debt. Number two, in order to do that, you need a good product vision from the head of product. So you need to lean on that person to get you that product vision now. Definitely makes makes a lot of sense. I know here too, uh, in our product teams, one of the things we've done is not only have we adopted a philosophy that like every single sprint, every chunk of work needs some level of tech debt in it to make sure that we're, we're taking care of ourselves. We've also even gone above and beyond and said, hey, we also have user experience debt. Right. We have this debt. Like, it's not about like, you know, how fast some piece of code is in the back end. We also have, man, this part of the dashboard, we haven't touched it in six months. And like, it just, it needs some help. It's time. Right. Yeah. Uh, affording ourselves that, that ability too. But, you know, since, um, since you brought up the topic, and I know this is a topic that virtually every engineering team, uh, especially in parts of the world that are growing like crazy, like China, Brazil, India. This is such a major topic. Um, the principle of refactoring constantly every sprint, that's a good principle, but that will not address your tech debt. And this is something that a lot of times teams learn the hard way. Uh, what it does is, of course, it's good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggest it's not good, but it's, it's all local. Uh, if the problem with the real core with tech debt are those infrastructure areas that impact all of us, it's not, it's way beyond what one team can do. It needs, it's like, uh, it's like if you've got a road that's just destroyed, you could ask every owner of a home along that road to go fix a little bit on their front. That's not going to fix the road. Sure. You know, you really need to take a bigger. So again, 
um, I try to encourage teams to uh, take this very seriously. For sure, for sure. Uh, so while leadership, you know, uh, through empowering engineers, while leadership has to obviously in that situation give engineers trust, right? Uh, I think the other side of that coin is how do engineers help leadership have confidence that that's they're making the right moves and going in the right directions through that? Yeah, uh, that's a great. That's actually a great question. In fact, restoring that trust across the company is often a big one. Um, I'm not necessarily trying to plug my new book, but in my new book, I profiled eight leaders, uh, two heads of engineering, two heads of design, two heads of product, and two heads of companies. And one of the uh, people I profiled is a longtime Silicon Valley head of engineering. Um, her name is Debbie Meredith. And she has, she was actually, I first met her at Netscape. She was the engineering VP for the Netscape browser, one of the most, at the time, the most successful product of its era. Um, and then she basically built a reputation. She works with several of the venture capital firms. And, you know, when they have a portfolio company that is, uh, their engineering is struggling for some reason. It might be because of engineering or it might be because of their executives. Very often it's because of the executives is why they're struggling because of the issues you're getting at, Matt. And so Ebby, uh, Debbie has built a reputation of going in for a few months and as like an interim CTO and turning around the organization and then uh, helping to recruit a full-time permanent CTO. Uh, and what she's really doing is rebuilding that trust. She's rebuilding the trust because a lot of the times, as she points out, a lot of the times the, the CEO has never worked with a professional engineering organization. They don't even know what to expect. They don't know how. Uh, and, and they often are because they don't know how to work, they undermine that trust. And so she works with both sides. She works with the teams to become so that they know what they need to do to be dependable, reliable. If they say that this replatforming is going to be done in 18 months, it needs to be done in 18 months. <laughs> if it, you know, I, I picked that one because that's infamous for dragging on to multi, multi years. Yeah never actually finishing. Uh, and similarly, the, the leaders, the CEOs need to understand how to work effectively with an engineering organization. You don't outsource parts. You don't tell them the features to build. You give them problems to solve. You empower their engineers. So um, I, I, that's a great example. And she shares sort of what she does when she goes into this company. She's tra she's transformed over 50 engineering organizations now. It's remarkable. Awesome. Uh, yeah. But that's, you know, a good engineering leader is, is absolutely gold and worth, you know, critical to success. Awesome. Awesome. I'll, well, I'll definitely be buying a book and checking it out. Uh, in terms of uh, a team working on some of the stuff, we talked a little bit about discovery and a little bit how about how engineers are in charge of delivery. When do teams start to transition kind of from discovery to building? What what Where do we get conviction from? What's the threshold for conviction to go start something? Yeah, good question. Well, first of all, I want to emphasize discovery and delivery happen all the time. They're continuous, right? They're just, just like delivery is going on every day. You don't stop coding. Uh, and hopefully, you know, most of you, most of the people on this call are doing some form of continuous delivery. Uh, that's at least most of the companies I work with are. And um, so delivery is going on all the time. Similarly, discovery is going on all the time. Discovery is uh, now some days we generate a few backlog items. Some days we generate a lot, but it's uh, it's an activity going all the time. Discovery, and just to make sure this is clear, that requires product design and engineering. Like I said, if the first time your engineers see an idea is at sprint planning, you have totally failed. Mm -hmm. So they should have seen it way earlier. Now, the real answer to your question is, when do you know you're ready? This is a judgment call. Because I mentioned before the four risks in product, value, usability, feasibility, viability. The product manager, the designer, and the tech lead, at least, those three need to consider each thing you're planning to build and decide, how risky is this? Yeah. Where are the risks? 
And then we also talk whenever we assess risk, we assess consequence. If we screw this up, is this a big deal? Or is this like a easy, we can just do a patch the next day or something. Um, so we consider those things and then we say, all right, this is a risk. It's a technical feasibility risk. We don't know if it's going to take two days to build or two months to build. So we need to look into that. That's the risk. And here's how we're going to look into that. And then there's the question of what level evidence do you need before you feel like you have enough data to say, we're good. We're going to go build this now. We're going to do the delivery work. When I say build, production, quality, implementation. So that is, uh, that's the judgment. It's different on everything. Uh, and I will say that the senior engineer, the tech lead is the one that makes a lot of those calls, a lot of those judgment calls. Makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, I think that's all we have time for, for questions, Marty, but I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>